all have our own life stories. These are stories that are so unforgettable that we like to tell them over and over again to other people. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have heard my signature Pandesau story, but since it's one of my all-time favorite stories, it's my life story, uh, I would like to tell it again, and for the, especially for the sake of those younger ones who have not heard it. The year was 1972. It was in Cotabato City. We were all in our family tricycle on our way to a party. And boy, do I love parties, especially back then. 1972 in Cotabato, not much else is happening, you know, in, in those days. So I was uh, already all set. I was in my Sunday's best. I had my black leather shoes on me, and I even put a lot of Tancho pomade on my hair. Now, if you don't know what Tancho is, don't worry. You just need to know that it's simply a very fragrant hair product that you put on your hair to make you look dashing and handsome and smelling good at the same time also. So we were all ready to go, but then my mom noticed something. My mom noticed that I had two pieces of pandesals in my chubby little hands. He, she doesn't know how I got them. Probably on our way out, I grabbed them from the dining table, but I had them in my hands. And my mom was telling me to let them go. You know, leave them, leave them. But for the life of me, I just held on to them. I'm not sure if this was because, you know, the, the ride to the host's house was probably around 10, 15 minutes. That's a long time. You know, I might get hungry along the way. So I made sure that I had food with me. As we got to the host's house, as we were getting off the car, my mom says, leave them, leave them in the car. But I would not let go. I held on to them in my hands. Even as we rang the doorbell and as the host opened the door, as we got in, I was still holding on to them until when we got inside and I saw all the sumptuous food on the table. Lechon, spaghetti, barbecue, cakes, leche flan, ice cream. Oh boy. And at that moment, Suddenly, the two pieces of pandesal just don't look as tasty as they used to. And uh, especially at that moment, you know, after such a long ride and, and hanging on, grasping them in my chubby little hands, they have uh, become squished and damp and uh, dirty. In fact, if you look at them, they look like somehow, I don't know how, but, but they, they look like they have turned back into flour, you know, the dough and... And at that moment, I did the only thing I could inside someone's house, looking at all the food. I did the only thing I could. No, I did not eat them. If I had eaten them, then I would have no more space for the real food. So what I did was I simply gave them to my mom. It was at that moment that I was willing to give them up. Now, that story I've told so many times, I've lost count how many times. And many lessons have been drawn from this story. You see, stories are powerful much, much more than a lecture could ever do. Stories communicate in a powerful way. And keep that in mind as we look at Luke chapter 20, verse 9 to 19, because here Jesus was telling the people a powerful story. This happened after, remember last time we saw Jesus was confronted by the religious authorities. They asked Jesus, who gave you this authority to do all these things? And Jesus asked them a question they would not answer. And in the end, Jesus said, I will not answer you also. After that, Jesus told them this parable. And being the master storyteller, we know that Jesus, his stories are always powerful. And so here I want us to get a good look, okay? We want to see what exactly was Jesus' point. What was he trying to tell them? And at the same time, what is he trying to tell us today? And I hope that we would truly understand his desire. Luke chapter 20, verse 9 to 19. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it out to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one they also beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. The owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they would respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. 
What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Jesus asked. He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. You know, when I read that story, immediately another passage from the Bible came to my mind. And, and it reminds us that what Jesus was saying is not only for those people back then, but, it's, but it is also for us. Hebrews chapter 1, the first two verses of Hebrews. It says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also He made the universe. So it's very clear what, what this story that Jesus was telling, this parable, who the characters were. The owner of the vineyard is God the Father. The farmers, the tenants, are the religious leaders, and by extension, those of us who have received words from the Lord. The servants, the ones who were sent, are the prophets who were sent to warn Israel over and over again. And finally, the son of the owner whom he loved is, of course, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the beloved Son of God. And in the first part of this story, as Jesus was telling it, we see that Jesus was actually describing the story of our lives, our stories, because we're all the same. We're all in the same boat. So first, from verse 9 to 12, we see the story of our lives. You see, the vineyard rightfully belongs to the owner. So the owner rightfully gets a share of the harvest. The farmers as tenants, as, the, as stewards, they were, they were given charge, they were taking care of the garden, taking care of the vineyard. They are required to give a portion of the earnings to the owner. The farmers, however, had, you know, they, they would not do it even though they had no right to hold on to something that they don't own. In fact, if you look at the story, they were acting even more violently. It's, it's as if they're the owners as if they have turned the table around. They would not give to the owner what rightfully belongs to him. Not only that, they disrespected the servants sent by the owner to them. They won't listen to them. They even physically beat them up and treated them shamefully. Have you ever seen videos on YouTube or on social media of robbers who rob people, they snatch the bags from people, but then they turn around and they acted as if they were the victims, okay? And, and, and they would beat the, 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 the actual owner of the bag, and they would beat them and, and curse at them and say, why are you stealing my bag? They act as if they own the bag, and the actual owner, they are the, the robbers, okay? So they've turned the table around, and they shouted at them, they, they beat them, and, and people will gather, and eventually people would, would gang up on the victim, thinking that he, she's the robber, well, in fact, it was the other person. I think that's what's happening here. The tenants of this vineyard, they have turned the table around. They were acting so violently as if they were the owners, as if they, they own the place. And so the servants, when they come, they don't like the message. They don't like you know, what they were said, telling them, although it's, it's the truth. But because they did not like the truth, they mistreated the messengers. They even kicked them out. They treated them shamefully. And back in those days, probably they shaved their beard, half, half, of, half of their beard. So, so you know, it, they, they look so shamefully. And, and they would tear their clothes and expose them, their nakedness to others. That's how they treated the servants. So they did not like the message and they mistreated the messengers. In our case, we need to remember in our lives, what rightfully belongs to God. Sometimes we, we are mistaken. We think that, oh, this is my life. This is my wealth, my wisdom, my abilities, my time. And we forgot that everything we own belongs to God. You remember the, the time that Jesus was challenged, like, should we pay taxes or not? They were asking him. And this was his answer in Mark chapter 16, verse 6, chapter 12, verse 16 to 17. They brought the coin, which he asked for, and he asked them, who's image is this on the coin and whose inscription caesar's they replied 
Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. What is Jesus telling us? In whose image are we created in? Okay, we are created in the image of God. So there's the image, the imprint of God upon us. So everything we have, even our, our very being, has the image of God on it. Therefore, we belong to God. So we need to give to God what belongs to God. And when we do not do that, okay, when, 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 when you do not give to Him what belongs to Him, then who are we? We are robbers. We are stealing from God. You say, how can that be? How can that be? Well, in the Old Testament time, when the Israelites would not give to God what belongs to Him, one-tenth of all that they have, God said that they were stealing from Him. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, we are very familiar, but we'll look at, we will look at verse 8 to 9. Here, God says, Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. When we don't give to God what belongs to God, then we are robbing Him. Now, of course, in the New Testament, the tithing, one-tenth, is not repeated. Okay, so the command to give one-tenth is not repeated in the New Testament. However, the principle here is that in the New Testament, all that we own, all that we own belongs to God. Therefore, it's not just one-tenth. It should be all. So to give one-tenth is a good basis. Okay, it's, it's in the Old Testament. I think it's a good basis for us. At this, it, That's the, the very least. The minimum that we need to give is one-tenth of what we have. And on top of that, whatever the Spirit is impressing upon our hearts to give. And when we start to think, hey, this is my life. This is my body. This is my work. This is my business. This is my money, my future. I can do whatever I want with it. Then we are sorely, sorely mistaken. One day, we will have to give an account when the real owner comes. And when we stand before Him, we will be judged for all that we have done. Now, that judgment will not be a judgment of whether we're saved or not. Because we're, as believers, we are saved by Him, not by our good works. But our works will be judged for the, the quality of our work, whether they are good or bad. We will have to give an account. We will be held accountable for how we have used the life, the talents, the resources that God has graciously given to us. There's a story about the Queen of England. It's an old story. I'm, I'm not sure the accuracy of it, but I think the meaning is, is very powerful. They said, it was said that the Queen of England would like to stroll around in town, dress up as a commoner so that she would not be recognized and she would be without her escorts and she would be alone. One time, as she was walking in, the, in town early in the morning, she wandered through into the more provincial part uh, and, and it started to rain. And she saw from a distance that there was a small house in front, so she quickly ran to the house, knocked on the door early in the morning. A woman was inside still sleeping and she was grouchy, like, like why would someone knock on the door this early hours? And she said, who is it? What do you want? The queen, without introducing herself, said, uh, Ma'am, it's, it's raining outside. If, I may, if you may be so kind, can I borrow an umbrella from you? Ah, the old lady inside says, ah, Okay, okay, okay. And she looked through the house, found the rattiest umbrella, broken handle with holes, and, and it's a terrible, in terrible shape. And she just opened the door a little bit, shoved the umbrella out, and said, Here, take it. The Queen of England thanked her and was on her way. The next morning, when the old lady woke up, there was the entire entourage of the Queen of England right outside her front door. And, you know, all the soldiers were there, the escorts, the, the, the carriage and everything. And then when she opened the door, a soldier dressed in full uniform walked towards her with the broken umbrella in his hands. And he approached her and said, the Queen of England would like to thank you for the umbrella. And, and when the soldier turned around, he can hear the old lady saying to herself, if I had only known that it was for the Queen of England, I would have given her the best. I would have given her the best. Brothers and sisters in Christ, one day we will have to stand before the King of Kings 
and we know this already. So what would you say on that day? Would you also say, if I known that it was for the king, I would have given him my best. You see, one day we will have to give an account of the life that we have lived, of how we have use the resources, the life that he has given to us. So number one, this is the story of our lives. So how would we live it? Secondly, we want to see that he is the Lord of our lives. He is the Lord of our lives. Verse 13 to 16. Here we see that these people, the farmers, the tenants, they mistreated not only the prophets, but eventually when the beloved son was sent to them, they murdered him. They killed him. And this cannot be anything but first degree premeditated murder. In fact, they discussed over this and they decided to do it. So it was intentional. It was premeditated. And there was even a strong motive. They said it themselves because if we kill the son, then we would inherit this vineyard. So there was motive to kill him. The farmers threw the son out of the vineyard and killed him. Eventually, in real life, the religious leaders will lead Jesus outside the city of Jerusalem and they would crucify him. They would kill him. They would even pierce his side to make sure that he is dead so that they can get rid of him and they would keep everything to themselves. You see, they thought that by getting rid of Jesus, by getting rid of the son, that they would get to keep everything. Today, many people mistakenly think the same way. If I would reject Christ, if I don't want to believe in him, if I, if I turn, turn him away, if I kill Jesus in my mind by not accepting him, then that's the end of him. Then, you know, I, I can live life my way, then everything will belong to me. We think that if I don't see him, if I don't think about him, then I don't have to mind him. It's the same way that we deal with many things in life, like death. We don't want to talk about death. We, we don't want to think about uh, the final exam upcoming. And we think that by not thinking about them, by not minding these things, then we, we, we don't have to deal with them. They thought the same way. They thought that by killing the son, that they would get what they want. But oh, how wrong they were, how wrong they were. Killing the son is not the end of the story. We may think that, okay, Jesus told this parable and oh, they killed the son. That's it, that's it. No, killing the son is not the end of the story. If you look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 to 11, after Jesus came in verse eight to, uh, 7 and 8, Jesus came, he submitted himself to death, even death on the cross. Then verse 9, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in, he in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Hey, look at that, and under the earth. And every tongue confess and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is Lord. Like it or not, believe it or not, accept it or not, He is. So either you acknowledge that He is Lord willingly and happily and joyfully, gladly, or you have to acknowledge that He is King, He is Lord begrudgingly, okay? They will have to drag you out even though you're fighting, you don't want to admit it. You have to, you have to because He is. So this leads us to the third point. If He truly is the Lord of our lives, then we must make a choice. There's a decision to be made here, the choice of our lives. What would be your choice? How, how would you deal with this? If he is the Lord of our lives, what should you do? Jesus is crystal clear here about what would happen to the farmers who killed the son and rejected the owner. They rejected the message from the owner. In the same way, those who rejected Jesus, those who will reject Jesus as the Savior, as the Messiah, they too will lose their lives. Now, you can literally hear the audible gasp of all those people listening to Jesus. <gasps> what? God forbid. You know, God forbid. God, God will not do that. He, he, of course he will not do that. He, he would kill those who kill the son. No way. No, no, no. Jesus will not do that. God will not do that. God would not kill those who kill the son. God, God will never do that because God is gracious. He is kind and he is patient and loving. He would never do that. I can keep on rejecting him and he would keep on loving me. He would always love me and accept me no matter what. Even if I, if I reject the son, even if I kill the son, because he is God, he is love, he will always love me. 
Oh, how wrong we are. How wrong we are to think that way. That even if we keep rejecting Him, that He would continue to, to save us, to love us. If you reject Him, then your end is just like these people. Notice how, what Jesus did. When they said, God forbid, Jesus looked directly at them and told them this. Okay, Jesus looking directly at them. You know, when someone important is looking directly at you, maybe your teacher, your, your, you know, your uh, principal, someone you respect, looking at you directly. You know, it's, it's different when they are saying, okay, class, everybody needs to listen. As if, he, if she or he is looking directly at you and say, hey, you need to listen to me. You know, it's, he, mean, he means business, okay? You better listen because this is very serious. So Jesus looked directly at them and told them that he is the cornerstone. What the builders have rejected have become the cornerstone. So you will say, so, but, but what is the cornerstone? What, what does Jesus mean by the cornerstone? You see, back then when people build a house, they set the cornerstone first, okay? It's the first piece of stone to be placed. And from that cornerstone, it sets the, not only the direction, the orientation, but it's against that stone that everything else will be built. If you are aligned with the cornerstone, then you're retained. But if you go against the cornerstone, if you're not aligned with him, then you will be removed and destroyed because you're not aligned with the cornerstone. So that's what Jesus is saying. Those who go against him will be crushed. Those who are crushed by him, those who are on top, he, when the cornerstone falls on them, they will be crushed because why? That is a standard. That is the first stone. If you reject him, there's no middle ground. Either you accept him or you reject him. There's no middle ground here. If you stand with him, he will be the foundation of your salvation. But if you reject him, you will be dashed to pieces on him. Notice the religious leaders, they were fuming mad, okay, because they realized that Jesus was talking about them. And we might get a big kick out of it. Hey, yes, yes, Jesus preached it. But friends, at least they knew, they realized that Jesus was talking about them. How about us? Do we know, do you know that Jesus is talking about you also? He's talking about you and me. We may think, who, me? I'm not like them. I'm not like the religious leaders. But think about it. In, our, in the way we live, in our action, we are just like them. Because time and time again, God tells us things. He wants us to do things. He, through Bible study, through your devotion, through preachers, through friends, He's telling us what to do. And yet over and over again, we reject Him. We ignore Him. We don't want to listen to Him. And time and time again, we are disrespecting Him by not paying attention to the message that he is given, giving to us. Because we are not listening. We are not listening. Let me ask you, if you are, let, let's go back to the important person, okay? That person is talking to you directly, looking you in the eye, and instead of listening and obeying, you pull out your phone, and you say, aha, uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, what, 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 ah, uh, yeah, mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you're looking at the Instagram videos or whatever you're looking at, and you just say, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, keep talking. Uh, I'm listening, I'm listening. What does that say to the one talking to you? It, you're, you're disrespecting him. You're saying, I, you're not important, okay? Yeah, this is more important. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh. Yeah, that. You see, you're, you're not even paying attention to him. And that's a choice that you will have to make. You can keep on ignoring him, but eventually you also will be crushed. Whether you accept him or not, does not change the fact that he is Lord, okay? Whether you accept him or not, he is still Lord. But whether you accept him or not will determine your destination for you. For you, it will change everything depending on whether you listen to him or not. So the choice, this is a choice of our lives. What would you choose? Would you choose to obey him, to listen to him, to believe in him, to follow him? Or you would choose to say, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. keep talking, keep talking. Or you reject him, you don't want him. It does not change him, it changes you. What do you call that experience when you are walking maybe down a narrow hall or, or you're walking along the street and, and, and when you, someone is meeting you, when you turn to the right, they, they go to the left and, and you're going back and forth like, <laughs> like you're dancing. What is that term called? Do you, do you know what is, what is it called? 
I don't know, okay? I don't know. I tried to look it up. Uh, there's actually no English word for that, for that action, okay? The, the moving back and forth in, in, in synchronized steps, synchronized dancing. Uh, they say that in other languages they have, but I, I don't know the word for it. But it's when you are going back and forth and you could not pass each other until a time one of you have to stop and make way for the other person to pass. You see, when I was younger and uh, bigger and stronger, what I would do is I would like try to walk down a crowded street or a train station or I want, and I want to see how far I can go and people will just part way, okay? Because I was pretty big and I'm walking down, you know, and, and people will part way and part way because they see me coming, they don't want to run into a wall and so they would part way. I, I want to see how far I can go until I meet somebody even bigger than I am, okay? Even stronger than I am. Then I would have to give way to them. You see, when, when, when we realize that Jesus is the cornerstone, he does not change. It's up to you whether you want to accept him or not. Or it's up to you, you want to reject him, then you will be crushed to pieces. He's immovable. Just like the, the walking down the road, you never see people doing that against a, a light post. Okay, can you do that? Play chicken against a light, light post and see who will move. If you, if you keep to your ways, you will get hurt. You will get hurt if, if you bump against that light post because it is immovable. In the same way, we have this choice. It's up to you whether you want to accept him or not. The choice is yours. So what is your life story? Perhaps even more importantly, how will your life story end? How will it end? On that final day, I hope that all of us will say, I'm so glad that I've given my best to the Lord and we will enjoy being with him forever. I hope none of us will say, if I had known it was for the king, if I had known that this choice was for the Lord, I would have given him my best because at that moment, it would be too late. It would be too late to regret. So I hope and pray that all of us, our life stories will truly be one that will honor him as we accept him, as we believe in him, and as we follow him so that ultimately on that final day, our life stories will be the best stories that we get to tell over and over again when we get to heaven. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for reminding us about who you are and what we are to do. What are the choices that we have? May we choose to believe in you. May we choose that which is right, which is to follow you, to believe you, to be who you say you are, and commit to obey everything you say. Help us, Lord, to make the right choice, to make the choice for you rather than against you. May we not be like the tenants, the farmers in the story who reject you over and over again and reject even the son. They killed your son because they would not want to follow you. May we make the right choice so that we will have the best ultimate life story to tell when we are in eternity. This is our prayer. In Christ's most precious name we pray. Amen.